Welcome to the Sweet Slumber Podcast, the good, the bad, and the sleep deprived. I'm your host, Meredith Bruss. I'm here to teach you about my supportive, nurturing sleep solutions for infants and young children. We'll also be discussing the highs and lows of motherhood, what will help you feel whole and rested, and I'll explain what you can do now to help your little one thrive in every way for many years to come. I am excited to help you experience more fulfillment as a mother. Hello, welcome to the show today. I'm happy to share one of my favorite people in the whole world with you. Her name is Trisha McConnell. I call her Trish. She's amazing. She's here to speak with us today. Hi, Trish. Hi. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And thanks for being prepared more than I was. (laughs) You can't always count on that, so we'll see. That's all I'm going to say. A little admission there. Um, So anyways, I'm just really excited to have you. And seriously, I've been waiting to share you for a long time. So this is so exciting. Thank you. Thank you again. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about Trish and she'll tell you a lot more because she is the best one. (laughs) She's an expert on herself. (laughs) Uh, She's a certified speech language now I'm already messing up my, my speech, speech language pathologist trained in orofacial myofunctional therapy that has an extensive background in treating patients of all ages. She has experience treating a variety of diagnoses, diagnoses, is that the right way? Uh-huh. <laughs> Including, but not limited to, infant feeding difficulties, oral motor disorders, speech sound disorders, apraxia, tongue thrust, thumb sucking, oh man, I can't say the real name, but TMD, <laughs> feeding difficulties, mouth breathing, tongue ties, and more. She's actually pretty amazing. She consistently works with a multidisciplinary team to treat the whole patient, working in conjunction with ENTs, lactation consultants, orthodontists, dentists, chiropractors, and many more medical professionals. And I know this from experience. She received her master's degree in 2012 from Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She has since to practice in Iowa and Illinois and is certified by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Are you impressed? <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Sounds very fancy when you read it out loud. Wait, I was talking to the listeners, but are you impressed with yourself? <laughs> I know you're always training. So like that's just a small amount of the training you've had. So with that said, will you explain what do you do? I mean, I just that's kind of like the medical explanation of what you do. And we've got a lot of people who are like, huh? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's a kind of broad question. So I'm going to give it to you in kind of age ranges because I treat from birth until basically end of life. Um, the oldest patient that I've ever had is in their late seventies. So um, there's a lot we can still change. Um, bodies change over time. So in my infants, I'm usually doing a lot of feeding and eating therapy regarding breastfeeding, bottle feeding, um, difficulties with latching, things like that, usually related to oral dysfunction. Um, mom is having pain, baby's having symptoms, et cetera. And we're kind of diagnosing and treating based off that. In my older children, it can be mouth breathing issues. It can be feeding and eating issues. Um, Myofunctional therapy is a neurological retraining of the muscle system. So not only are we reshaping the way the brain is responding to breathing and swallow and where the tongue is living in the mouth, um, but also we're strengthening um, oral facial musculature to support that system. So in my younger kiddos, um, we're treating a lot of diagnoses like mouth breathing, tongue thrust. Um, A lot of parents have sleep concerns with the young kiddos. We know how important sleep is. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, And then as we get older, a lot of my patients are coming because they have orthodontic issues. So, and we'll talk about it today, I'm sure, but your tongue and your lips and your cheeks are what actually shape your bite and your airway and your jaw growth and development. So if those things are not functioning properly, we do need orthodontic intervention like braces and expander, et cetera, which is not normal. We have just normalized dysfunction over time. We should not need orthodontics. So anytime we're needing orthodontics, those are the patients that I'm treating because we need to figure out why the the shape shifting is happening with the teeth. Um, And then my older patients, my adults, are a lot of TMJ issues. So temporomandibular joint disorder. Um, So popping, clicking, locking in the jaw, headaches, migraines. 
which goes hand in hand with sleep disorders. So my patients as adults that have sleep disordered breathing or obstructive sleep apnea usually have TMJ issues because they tie together. So um, we're treating the patient on how they breathe, how they swallow, where their tongue rests in their mouth, and to get them to optimally be able to function. And the way you do that is by good breathing and good sleep. So we're working on the oral, oral motor function to support that. Yeah, and that's why it's you need a team because you can't do all the things and you need a lot of other people to support what you're you're doing with your patients, right? Absolutely. So I am not afraid of referring out and my patients that see me may be overwhelmed, but also I recognize them and not afraid to say I can't do it all. Seeing me isn't going to fix the problem. I am an adjunct service to X, Y, and Z that is going to help you treat your whole body. Because if I'm trying to treat the way they're swallowing and breathing, I have to look at their posture. I have to look at their core. I have to look at their other functional um, capabilities that they're able to do, developmental milestones, things like that. Um, so yes, I cannot work alone. Those other referring providers, sleep consultants, dentists, ENTs, orthodontists, I can't function without them. So yeah. yeah. That's pretty exciting. Well, what I think is wonderful about that is, I mean, I have five kids and just one child could have so many different things that you could just feel so stuck, not knowing who to start with, where to go, who actually is going to be the right answer. And so I often will send people to you or to other myofunctional therapists just to get that first step, yeah. you yeah. know, so that then they do know, because I mean, I'm pretty impressed with all the different people. When I first met with you for myself, I mean, I've done this with one of my daughters too, but, um, finding that list of, of, of different specialists I could go to. And you were like, yeah, you're going to need almost all those. <laughs> we call myofunctional therapists like in our own little world, like the quarterbacks of treatment, because we are not necessarily the end all be all, but we do tie everybody together because a lot of times you're going to see one practitioner and you're getting one service. And you don't, you don't ever recognize that your other ailments that you're experiencing or issues that you're experiencing also are related to this disorder, but no one's referring you out for it. So um, I definitely feel like the networking piece with other providers is huge, but also you can't do the patient justice if you don't see them for their whole body and not just what your focus is on. So it is, it is a lot of moving pieces and my, ther my patients know when we go into this, I say this is not easy. There's a lot of people involved. It's a team approach but that's how my patients are successful because of that. So it's, it's when you started talking about it, I was like, I think this is one of my favorite things about what you do. Yeah. Because it's just rare to find someone who can say, Oh, you need to see that person. You need to see that person. You need to see they don't do it or they just don't know. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of it is just the lack of knowledge of how everything is tied together. I mean, what I do as a speech language pathologist, I was not taught in school. Um, I traditionally was treating articulation disorders and language issues, right? So people think of SLP or speech language pathologists and they think, oh, they help people say their sounds and help kids talk, right? That's usually how we're associated. But when I went and got out of school, I was doing that and I was really wondering why my patients weren't making progress faster. Um, I ended up having my daughter and having a ton of breastfeeding issues. Went and saw about seven different professionals, ENT, dentist, airway specialist, GI person. Everybody said she was fine, but she wasn't. Um, ended up going to a course on myofunctional therapy, bald the entire time. I was pumping in the corner like, oh, this is my daughter. Why has no one recognized that? Then I was like mom angry, but also professionally angry because why has no one taught me this? And it completely changed my world. I went back to my boss at the time and I said, I'm doing myofunctional therapy now because this is like my calling. And I literally called back all the patients that I had discharged because they plateaued, because they weren't making progress, that were stuck. And 50% came back. Almost every single one of them had myofunctional disorders. And then I was able to treat that and they made progress. And then I was sold. Because at first, you know, I was like, I don't know, I'm going to try, I'm going to see, I believe in it. But seeing those results, I was like, all right, game on. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm meant to do. And it's been, I haven't looked back since. 
Oh my gosh, I love that. I have never heard your little beginner story. That's amazing. And yeah. how thrilling. How thrilling yeah, to really see this through. Well, like you're you're that answer for me because I mean, put my kids aside who were 15 to 21 when I found out, 14 to 21 when I found out they had tongue ties and and all the issues. Um, you know, we'd seen at least 20 professionals for them. But I found out about mine at the same time. 47 yeah. and I don't know how many people have been in my mouth or treated me for different things. So yeah, what you do is pretty important and I love seeing the work spread, but I just wish that everyone had a Trish. <laughs> I say that all the time. By I'm the way. out there. You just got to find us. I mean, that's the hardest part is we're not trained in school. So you have to seek out that training and that's why we're so far and few between, but we do exist. And I have resources. So if people are not local to Iowa, I have website and contacts. I have cohorts that are in other states. I have a, um, a, a big corporation that I work with out in Calabasas that has a huge professional directory. So if people need resources, I will try my very, very best to find you one. Yeah. And you're going to share some of those links with me, right? So that I can tell my yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. So. I don't know which which uh, topic would be great to dive into right now. I mean, I love talking about tongue tie. How about what disorders do you see the most? So I would say when people come into my office, it's usually rightfully so, meaning that they're there knowing that they should be there. Very, very rarely anymore do I get somebody that's coming in that doesn't, doesn't need myofunctional therapy. And going back to um, normalizing dysfunction, you know, we all are used to saying, oh, baby snoring is so cute. My mom snores, my dad snores, I snore, it's fine. And, you know, my mom had braces. I had braces two times. You know, they're saying these things. None of those things are normal, but they're so common that as a culture, we accept it as normal. So what I treat is ranging in a bunch of things that are very common symptoms that are just not being recognized as treatable. I mean, Meredith, as you're listening and listening to me talk about these things when we first met, you're going, we can fix that. We can help that. I can get better. I can, I've can. i been dealing with X, Y, and Z my whole life. No one's ever said anything. So sleep disorders is a huge one. And there are many, many signs and sleep, sleep disorders and symptoms of the sleep disorders that people don't even know are symptoms of issues. I so, I mean, that's definitely one thing we can talk about. Um, yeah. And I'll go back to that. But, yeah, the sleep disorders is is a huge piece. Um, undiagnosed sleep disorders um, and mouth breathing issues. A lot of parents now are recognizing and seeing things about how it's not typical and not normal for their child to have the mouth open. Or the parent is saying, I've been a mouth breather my whole life. Yeah. And, you know, that that's one of the things people think is cute. It's crazy. Like I go into Canva to look for baby sleep pictures to create something. And like half of them, baby's mouth, child's mouth is open. But like even my, in my own family, I don't want to name names, but I've heard this comment. Oh my gosh, it's so cute. And I'm like, no, it's, not good. it's concerning. No, but I, again, that's normalizing that dysfunction. We, we don't portray it as for what it really is. Um, but yeah, I mean, excessive drooling. I mean, you see the babies and they have drool all over. Well, they're drooling because their mouth is open. That's not typical, even though they're producing more saliva because they're teething. Excessive drooling just means mouth is open, right? But I'm treating, yes, the mouth breathing, definitely swallow issues. So like orthodontists are very typical at saying tongue thrust, right? You have a tongue thrust and that's why your teeth are moving. <clears throat> so tongue thrust is a really big one I treat. If I'm getting a referral from an orthodontist or a dentist, it's typically for that or tongue tie. Um, so tongue tie, tongue thrust, mouth breathing, sleep disorders. The other one that I have coming in a lot is ADHD. And they're not looking for treatment of the ADHD. Parents are doing their own research and finding out that ADHD and sleep disordered breathing have the same symptoms. They mimic one another. So if their child is not responding to medication, they're saying, why aren't they responding to it? It's not helping. It's turning them into a zombie. This is not, this is not where I want to go. Um, so the ADHD piece has been really common. I treat a lot of patients that have allergies because they're mouth breathing. 
So it changes function. So um, those are the main ones, though, I would say. And then the TMJ issues, a lot of, a lot of TMJ issues. And even as young as eight, the, the child's jaw will pop and click. No pain because we're young. We don't experience that yet. <clears throat> but again, normalizing that dysfunction and the child will be popping their jaw and they're like, look what I can do. But we're not addressing these things as a dentist when we're opening their mouth and they open their mouth and pop, right? That's a red flag. That's not normal function. Um, but we're, those are usually the diagnoses that I'm, that I'm working with. <clears throat> I just want to say that you brought a few things to my memory. One was when I first met you and I was like, I just want to learn. I just want to eat up everything you have to tell me. I remember recording the first conversation like five minutes in. I was like, hold on. <laughs> this is amazing. And I remember you telling me about helping people that were like 70 get over ADHD or sleep disorders. And I was like, what? How is that possible? And I was still in that like stage of trying to figure everything out for my family. And that's exactly what started me on this path was how in the heck everybody, including me, has ADHD. So six of us. And my husband is extremely well functioning. So he's not a question. <laughs> he's the one that we all go, how are you so organized? How do you do that? But um, anyway, that just kind of piqued my interest like how in the heck is this even possible and then the tongue-tied education I started learning about and so going to you is just like a fire hose but I loved it I loved it so I love this stuff and I love that I can speak to the truth here you know you're able to help my kids well I say kids because what you've taught me has helped me help all my kids. <laughs> yeah. but Emma especially with with oh man she was really really suffering and struggling and you've helped her just be a totally different kid who's awake feeling good functioning with less anxiety not on ADHD meds it's just so exciting what you do yeah she has really she's she's really come a long way and I mean if people stick to it, which myofunctional therapy, you have to be dedicated. Like this is not like do a little bit, get a lot. It's not a quick fix. But if you really put in the time, you will see the differences at the end of the day. Um, but you're not alone. I mean, I would say probably 50% of my evals, if it's a child, the parent is sitting there going, this is me. I do these things. Can you help me? Is, am I too old to be helped? Nobody's ever told me I, I've had jaw surgery. I've had braces three times. What? And I can prevent this in my child? Well, what about my other three kids, right? And then I see a whole family because the parents are going, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is the answer that we've been looking for this whole time. And so these, these things are genetic. And what I mean by that is tongue ties are genetic. They are passed down from generation to generation. So if one parent, mom or dad, or both have ties, that infant is more likely to have ties. Um, and so the other thing is our environment, our world now doesn't support oral function and oral health, which doesn't support sleep and breathing. We use a lot of pacifiers. We use a lot of bottles for prolonged periods of time. The sippy cups on the market, not great. Um, we are having a lot of pureed foods. Babies eat a lot of purees very, very early, far earlier than they should. Um, so we are not developing oral facial musculature. We're creating tongue thrust by sucking on that pacifier for, for longer than a year, right? It's, it is normal for babies to have sucking habits under the age of one. That's how they calm themselves and regulate their nervous system. But over the age of one, that pacifier, that bottle should be gone and we should be moving on to normal developmental things like straws and open cups. But in our society, it's about convenience, the squeeze pouches for purees, the pacifier so baby doesn't cry because it's socially unacceptable, right? Um, all of these, we're, we're not promoting breastfeeding as much as we should um, because of difficulty, because of our society and what moms have to go to to be able to breastfeed um, is an uphill battle to say the least. Um, and so I feel like our society has really minimized how important it is to be able to breathe, to be able to eat and swallow and sleep well, um, because we've accepted sleep apnea. 
get a CPAP, it's fine. It's, it's just so normalized. Um, but our allergies are through the roof. People are mouth breathing like crazy because they're allergic to everything because we have so much pollution and so many chemicals in our food. So you look a hundred years ago at what development was. We had beautiful straight teeth, nice big jaws, orthodontists really weren't even a thing. You look at other countries that eat whole foods, that have less pollution, that have less chemicals, beautiful jaws, beautiful airway, beautifully straight teeth, right? We just have a society that we don't value that. And we, we aren't doing the things to support that. So people ask me all the time, well, doesn't everyone have a myofunctional disorder then? Mouth breathing, tongue thrust, crooked teeth, kneading braces, etc. More people do, yes. It's far more common than it should be. It's just we're not recognizing it as an issue anymore because it's common. So, yeah, if people come in my door, most likely they do need treatment because most of us have myofunctional disorders in some way or another. I mean, even myself, I didn't recognize. I never had braces. I never had orthodontics. My teeth are straight, right? I do not have enough room in my mouth. I scanned my airway. My airway is like boop, teeny tiny. As I age, I'm starting to notice my sleep become more poor. So I'm, I'm treating myself. I've treated my own children, but you have to be able to see it to be able to find somebody to help you. So yeah. I had that exact same scenario, no braces, but you know, my mouth, I don't have room for my tongue yeah. and my airway was teeny tiny and my nose, my allergies. I'm allergic to everything. I just got tested like two weeks ago and yep, I'm allergic to like everything. And that's been an issue because now I have a CPAP and I've got one side I can hardly ever breathe out of. It's just a mess. A mess. So there, we're getting there. <laughs> yes. No, and I shouldn't, yeah, I shouldn't be complaining because you've been helping me. So yeah, that's <laughs> the coolest things. Well, like you said, it takes time. So it's not an overnight process. But one of the coolest things is the fact that you were able to help me strengthen the muscles in my airway and like my throat because when I had scans done, you couldn't even see. There was no like opening in my mouth, yeah. <laughs> in my in my airways where it was so tiny. But it's just incredible. Like I'm I'm so proud of of the things that you've helped me work on that no one has even heard of. I I went to someone to have my CPAP checked, like my to read the the data and make sure everything was functioning well, and and I was telling this lady what a myofunctional therapist was and she she's like an expert oh, okay. on and she's never heard of it and I'm just like oh man yeah this world is a mess and but, well, especially in the sleep world how scary yeah, is that it is but that's one more person that knows about myofunctional therapy now there you go Meredith you got well, it she actually wanted me to show her I opened my mouth and showed her how oh, there's an opening now Oh, sorry. When my daughter and I both had sleep tests done, the, the tech, I'm telling them all about what you do and how we're working on these things and we don't have to live with them forever. I oh, love so it. I love it. But it is, you are doing exactly what a majority of my patients do because once you see it and you see what changes it does, you want to like scream it at the rooftop, you know, because how many of your friends, family members, cousins, siblings, friends, kids, do you know that have these same issues? And if yeah, only everyone. somebody could say, Hey, I can help you. Or I know what's going on or I find know. somebody who does. Right. So that's awesome that you're doing that because that's what I do. And that's why I'm like, I will talk to anyone who will listen to me because the information is out there. That's what I was going to say. It's like, it's hard for me knowing what I know to not talk to everyone. <laughs> you get through a day of being in society. I try to keep it unless people ask questions because yeah. I can talk for hours. Yeah. Well, and if they're not receptive, they don't really want to know. You're just like, they're probably freaking out at you or like overwhelmed and like, what? They're not, they're not ready. So I, I'm blessed and I'm going to take a minute here to talk. I'm blessed because in my work, people come to me looking for sleep help. I have all these platforms where I can educate people on this. Um, my, my Facebook group, that's probably the one place I offer your sleep disorder survey 
um, more than anywhere, because I'm just hearing people talk openly with each other about different issues. They, they'll spill everything, you know, like three paragraphs uh -huh. for one, one question. <laughs> and, and I'm hearing all these signs. I see it in sleep groups, uh, mom support groups too. Um, I just hear all these signs and I just say, you know what? I think what you need to do is fill out the survey. This is the first thing for you to do right now. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Another thing is just meeting with someone on a, like a initial call where we're just meeting. It's not a consultation. It's just a, like a meeting. Um, I'll often hear signs then. And people, when they start learning about this, it's exactly what you said. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, I have that. And well, I have this too. And I've never been able to get help with that. Oh my gosh, that's my husband. You know, I had one lady tell me once my husband had to get medication to stop wetting the bed at, in college. And she's like, he's been yeah. fine since then, but like we never knew why. And that was the big thing in my family that my kids struggled with that way too long mm -hmm. and no one could help us. And that's yeah. a sign of a sleep disorder for children. So it's just yes. oh my gosh, it's so much to know. I love all the things that you've been sharing, especially about the normalizing and the things that we just think are normal because they're common. Oh, it's so, so exciting to talk about and it. Do you want me to talk about the sleep <laughs> symptom piece? Because I think that is yeah. the story of a cat paw. Um, that was cute. Um, no <laughs> like, um, the sleep That's symptom good. piece, because you're treating these families that are having these sleep disturbances, some are behavioral, some are emotional some are familial, right? They're situational, but there are those ones that can be stemming from something anatomical going on. And so the symptoms that I'm looking for of concerns, common symptoms, but we don't ever as a parent put them together and no doctor is ever talking about these. So the first one you're saying is bedwetting. Bed wetting is a very large symptom of sleep disordered breathing when you have other symptoms coinciding and I'll go what happens is we have these, these children after we are potty trained, there should be zero instances of wetting the bed in the middle of the night after we are fully potty trained, right? If we're having bed wetting into the age of three, four, five, eight, ten, I have a 15 year old right now that's going through this and he won't go to sleepovers and can't live his life because of this bed wetting. He's on medication and all these other things and it's still happening. So as adults, we no longer wet the bed usually. It ends up being you wake up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. Your body is alerting to that signal, but you still get up every night to use the restroom. So the bed wetting piece is a, is a causation from a lot of things. Um, one being fight or flight response. What are the responses that our body has when we are in fight or flight for stress, right? Sweating and urination usually. Um, the other one is at nighttime, your body tries to balance pH to become neutral. And the easiest way to eliminate and balance pH if the body's not able to do that successfully because the body's under too much stress is to eliminate and to urinate. So the, the bedwetting thing does need to be examined. Now it is not always airway issues that causes the bedwetting. There are anatomical issues related to the urinary tract, et cetera. That can cause that. There are some neurological disorders that can also, but you have to do a differential diagnosis, which means you have to look at the other symptoms surrounding it. So if my patient has restless sleep. They're tossing, turning, flipping. A lot of my parents are like, oh yeah, he karate kicks in the middle of the night. He's punching people. It's hysterical. But he's also sweating. He's also grinding his teeth. We're snoring. These We're waking multiple times and going into mom and dad's room in the middle of the night. These are not things that are normal. Now, the waking we should be like zombies when we sleep. Obviously, discounting circumstantial environmental things like your kids are waking you up crying, right? But you should be sleeping through the night. You should not be moving, tossing, turning, flipping, flopping, kicking, ending upside down, falling off the bed. Those are very common things that happen. Um, blankets are balled up into a little corner, you know, um, the, the snoring. Snoring is a huge concern at any age because Snoring is the sound of air hitting tissue that shouldn't be there. Air can hit 
congestion in the nose. Like you said, you have allergies, right? It can hit your adenoids towards the back of your nose, which is, which is soft tissue that helps clean and filter our airway. It can hit tonsils. It can hit your soft palate, which is what you were talking about, about your airway being bigger in the back. Your soft palate, where your uvula is, can hit and touch your tongue and cause vibration. Having a tongue in the wrong place can cause snoring. So there are so many different causations, none of which are typical. Sleep should be silent. Sleep should be quiet. Sleep should be restful. Sleep should not be chaotic and frantic. Um, the hot and sweaty is because we're under stress. We're flipping and flopping and tossing and turning to reopen the airway to keep us breathing well. And we're our body is stressing because of that. The grinding is the number one symptom of sleep disorder breathing because you're physically forcing the lower jaw to move forward and back when you're grinding. And every time you do that forward motion, it opens the airway space so that the person can breathe easier. And so when we have one of these symptoms, I go, okay, we need to look a little deeper, but more than likely we're having multiple. And on top of that, the biggest one is mouth open. As humans, as infants, we are made to breathe through our nose. So even if baby has mouth open, that doesn't necessarily mean their mouth breathing. It just means their mouth is open and they're going to be a mouth breather as they age if we don't correct it young, right? So I talk about close the mouth, close the mouth, close the mouth. But again, make sure you get an evaluation by somebody who knows what they're doing. Don't just close baby's mouth because what if there's a nose obstruction? But we want the mouth closed. We want us breathing through the nose. Mouth breathing is an emergency act done by the body saying, I am not getting enough oxygen. Hurry, 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 more oxygen as fast as I can. So the mouth open and the drooling on the pillow, the snoring, the grinding, the restlessness, those are huge sleep disorder concerns. And not saying they have apnea, because apnea means stopping breathing, but saying that they may not be getting enough oxygen, that their heart rate might be going too high, right? So these are things we, we need to consider. And when we're talking about behavioral, emotional regulation, ADHD, think about being a new mom. You are like not organized, chaotic, you're emotionally just all over the map, you can't process things, anxiety is super high, you might feel like you're depressed a little bit, it's because of lack of sleep. It's because of lack of sleep. Now imagine being a child or an adult that's had that their whole lives. Anxiety, depression, issues with weight gain, issues with hormones, issues with Attention and focus and ADHD, those are very common symptoms of sleep issues if we have those other red flags going on. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate all of that insight. It's so, so important for people to be aware of all these things because they're not normal. And that was a huge eye opener for me to learn about a lot of these things. Yeah. So I love that you equipped me with this, the survey that you, that you use. Um, and I just... I'm just always asking people to fill that out and saying, okay, this isn't normal. Go see so-and-so. Go, go talk to <laughs> Go find a myofunctional therapist. <laughs> because yeah. I, I work with people all over the world. If I can send them to you, I, I always do. And, yeah, and I even, absolutely. people are two hours away. I'm like, go see Trish. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me your sob story. Um, so gosh, there's so much to talk about. I, I don't know um, if you have a minute to explain a little bit about the, the problem with tongue tie, tongue ties being overlooked and posterior tongue ties and how they're not taken seriously. Can we talk about that just for a few minutes? Maybe we'll do another episode on that <laughs> later on. Yeah, tongue ties um, are pretty common in terms of when we're talking about nursing infants. So that is where parents are usually coming um, to hear this term. Now, um, in the hospital, tongue ties, yes, can impact feeding and eating, breastfeeding, etc. Many of the times, though, even though tongue ties are identified, the parents aren't told to do anything about it. And so unless they're having pain with eating or babies having issues gaining weight, parents are going home with a baby who they know is tongue tie or lip tie. Um, usually they're told a little bit, um, which is also not an accurate thing. You cannot be a little bit tied. You either are or aren't. Um, it's like the joke where I hear you can't be a little bit pregnant. You can't be a little bit tongue tied. You either are or you aren't. So because the tongue tie, what makes it a tongue tie is its impact on function. 
So it's not about what the frenulum, the tongue looks like, it's how it behaves. So feeding and eating issues are usually where it's the first sound that parents are hearing about ties. Now, when we're looking at, as we look into the real world of what a frenulum actually is and what a restriction actually is, we have seven frenum in our mouth. We have two on the upper um, cheeks. Um, that attach basically it what a frenum is is it attaches soft tissue to bone so your cheeks your lips to your gum line ridge here and then your tongue to the floor of your mouth for your mando mandible so um we have seven okay normal anatomy everybody has them that's not what makes it a tie what makes it a tie is when that tissue is too tight too thick or too short and impacts function feeding, eating, breathing, sleep, right? So, or speech. So um, the frenulum, when it's too tight or too thick, so for the tongue, we're talking about that band of tissue that connects the tongue to the floor. Um, tongue ties are often missed or misdiagnosed or diagnosed but not addressed because people don't understand what it can impact. Um, a lot of my families come in and we're doing an eval because they know they need braces, right? And they think they have a tongue tie, right? But they also have picky eating issues, reflux issues, constipation issues. They usually have issues with sensory stuff and other things going on developmentally. They didn't crawl. They had plagiocephaly, which means that their, the back of their head was flat or torticollis where they didn't turn their head to one side all of which the parents don't know are integrated into oral function and how the face and head and neck move, right? So tongue ties, usually the only time they're being diagnosed is when we're talking about feeding and eating in infants, right? Um, tongue ties can be anywhere in location from the tip of the tongue, attaching the tip of the tongue to the floor of the mouth, to the center of the tongue, to the back of the tongue, which is what's considered a posterior tie. All a posterior tie is, is it means that the tip of the tongue has good mobility and movement, but that the back of the tongue does not. The tongue is not one unit. It's an organ that has eight muscles. And at any point, that restriction of the frenulum can cause muscle changes, shape changes, and function changes. If there's too much tension on the tongue, the tongue is going to rest differently. It's going to swallow differently. It's going to help you breathe differently. Um, and those things impact what we've been talking about already with the sleep issues um, and things like that. Um, lip ties are also something that's pretty commonly discussed. And doctors commonly say, well, they'll usually fall down and tear it on their own. Now, have, have I seen that? Yeah. Is it common? No. Should we be waiting till our child falls on their face to rip a piece of tissue? Absolutely not. Those things can impact how they breathe through their nose versus through their mouth. If there's too much tension here and they can't close their lips, it can impact, of course, breastfeeding. It can also impact <coughs> how they move lips left and right. When, when babies and kids blow and they blow like that, right? Sometimes, yes, it's muscle function and behavioral and age, but I have kids that are eight, nine, 10 that blow like that because they cannot run the lips. Gummy smiles when you're an adult and you can see your gum line when you smile. There might be a lip tie. There might be a growth deficiency in the jaws caused by oral motor dysfunction from the tongue, the lips, and the cheeks. So the tongue tie is a huge, huge, huge component. It's very common in my patients <clears throat> because they have myofunctional issues, but they are also common because we ingest a lot of things. There's a lot of research and debate about what causes ties. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. It is an in utero thing. So this is happening while baby is developing, right? So we develop from proximal to distal. So what happens is out to in, and as the baby forms a suture at the midline, um, tongue ties can be considered a midline deficiency. So things related to cleft lip and palate sometimes, spina bifida, um, umbilical hernia issues, things like that can be tied to, to tongue ties. But basically what happens is it's an overdevelopment of tissue that doesn't dissolve. And so we're ending up with residual 
leftover excess tissue that's causing the issue. Well, one of the things I remember was shocking to me because I had just met so many people who had the feeding issues. I remember when you said, oh, I meet plenty of people who have tongue tie issues that feeding was just fine. I was so shocked by that. But I think that's something that parents need to hear because they either the doctor saying, oh, well, feeding's fine. We don't need to do anything. Or the parents thinking that. Yeah, I, w- I will tell you, majority of my families that come in, breastfeeding was totally fine. Their 8 and 10 and 12 year old had no issues, none. I would say it's actually more rare to have nursing issues with my older patients than to not. Now in my infants, they're usually coming in because there's nursing issues. So it's a little bit different population, but you're absolutely right. Most people breastfed for a year, two years, no issue, but also no issue can range because did mom have clogs or mastitis? Did those are indications of feeding issues? Did mom have um, to use a nipple shield? Did baby have colic? Did baby have reflux? There are so many symptoms that nobody is telling you are related to ties. Did mom have low milk supply? Now, obviously, low milk supply can come from other things. But if baby is not able to latch well and draw enough milk from the breast, you're not going to have a good milk supply because your body doesn't know to create more. So all of those things. Is it overproduction related too? It can be because, and some of it is hormonal. So there is, there is a component where you do have to recognize that. But at the same time, it can be because baby isn't able to keep up. So interesting. I think another thing that you taught me that was really intriguing um, was how a child could sleep well for a couple of years or a year and then just suddenly have terrible sleep issues. And I, I see that with like development, you know, like it's temporary or sleep falls apart for some reason, 18 month regression, stuff like that. But I remember you just telling me, look, you the child could have been just fine, but at some point it just all catches up and we start seeing more and more signs of sleep disorders. Do you want to speak to that really quick? So our body is a beautiful thing. Um, we create compensations of all kinds so that we can function every day, so that we can breathe every day, so we can do what we need to do to survive every day, right? Body just doesn't stop doing something because it's difficult. We find another way. So a lot of times what happens is baby has had sleep disorder issues their entire life, unrecognized because they were far and few between and we associated them and contributed them to normal function, right? Ah, he's just waking up in the middle of the night because X, Y, Z, right? He's teething, he doesn't feel well, he wants mom, he needs to nurse, he's hungry, he's sick, etc. As we age, um, we expect more, right? We want them to sleep better and longer stretches and through the night and not wake up. And so when they're starting to have those issues, we start to go, huh, this is super weird. But as time goes, your body is able to deal and overcome with this one issue and this one issue and this one issue, but then it becomes too much for the body to handle anymore. And the body starts to break down. So I'll have patients that are in their thirties that are like, I've literally never had any sleep issues, no snoring, no grinding, no this, no that, no anything. And I hit 35 and all of a sudden it's like, boom, I'm snoring, I'm this and that, right? I mean, that's me. So this is what I will tell you. Your body compensates beautifully and makes do with what it has. But eventually you lose muscle tone. You lose strength because we're aging, right? And your body goes, this is really challenging to keep up. And then we start seeing these symptoms popping through. Now we have TMJ issues. Now we're getting headaches and migraines. Um, I'll have kids that have been doing really, really well. Parents swear that they've been functioning really well. Attention was great until seven. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, all these ADHD symptoms are showing up and they're sleeping really poorly and all these things. It's because the body was like, that's it. I'm done. I can no longer deal with the deprivation of oxygen, with the difficulty with the restless sleep, and I can't take it anymore. And then you start to see those symptoms pop up. We also start to see more symptoms. So then it becomes more visible and, and standing out because then they start to feel bad. And you can see that, or you start to feel those symptoms. They affect you in other ways. And then we draw attention to it. So like Emma, my daughter, she was 16 when all of a sudden she just couldn't wake up in the morning. 
And she was walking around school just dragging. She had no energy. She was winded. Her anxiety peaked at like eight, eighth grade, you know, ADHD. That's around the time she was diagnosed with that. And so I can attest to that. But also for me, like I remember functioning just fine until my 40s. And then my sleep just got worse and worse. And I started suspecting a sleep disorder. My family told me how bad my snoring was. My husband had snored our entire marriage. It wouldn't go see a doctor for his uh, sleep disorder. Um, so he was first because <laughs> he always had the issue. But for me, it was like, what? I don't snore. <laughs> it's just crazy how all that happens. But I'm just happy to be able to share this insight with my listeners so that they can understand these things that they're not normal, but they are common. And the more people know about these things, the more that we can help each other. You know, it may not, this may not be you, but I promise you're going to meet someone. You're going to see a child. You're going to, something's going to pop up and you can remember this conversation and be like, oh, actually, you might want to go see someone about that, right? Absolutely. There is definitely, it's one of those things where I can't watch a movie anymore because I see it so frequently. It's out there. You just have to know what you're looking for. And once you do, then you're like, oh no, close my eyes, ignore it. So it is there. And, and, and it is really hard too, because just nobody's talking about the symptoms, but if you're, you know, thank you for doing this because now people can be aware of the breathing and the sleep and the swallow and all these other things, the feeding issues, picky eating and, and go, okay, maybe this is the answer I've been looking for. I'm going to investigate this more. Um, and if it's not myofunctional related, the myofunctional therapist will find you somebody who can give you answers. Like I said, quarterbacking is one of the, the best things we do. So um, it's there, but I, I just thank you so much for doing this. Cause I really getting the word out is the hardest part and letting people know that it can be helped and you don't have to deal with pain and sleep issues and all the other things that we've talked about today. There is resources out there. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great way to wrap things up. So thank you so much. Um, appreciate you. Cause I know you're so busy. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Of course. And for sharing your knowledge and your experience uh, that you've worked so hard <laughs> for so many years to to gain. So um, can you just let my listeners know how to find you and how maybe some resources for them to find out more about tongue tie, sleep disorders, some of the other issues? Yeah. So my company name is My Myo Works. Um, we are in Bettendorf, Iowa. Um, you can Facebook us. It's just my Mayo works. Um, my Instagram is my Mayo mama. Um, and so I do a lot of posts on my patient treatment and coordination, things like that on there as well. Um, if you're looking for resources for myofunctional therapy in general or sleep disorders and things like that, um, there's a few places, a few hubs that are really, really informational. Um, one is the breathe Institute. Um, and if you Google it, it'll come up. It's the first one. Dr. Zaghi and his team um, has really done a great job at giving resources to families. Um, if you guys cannot find resources, my email, I can give it to Meredith and she can post it on there. Um, and you guys can email me personally if you have questions. Um, the other in, the other resource is AOMT, so A-O-M-T, info.org. That's a really good one. So it's the Academy of Oral Facial Myology. Um, they're great. And then IAOM.com. And so IAOM is the International Oral Facial Myology. <clears throat> and basically they are certifying myofunctional therapists and they have a lot of resources on there as well. So Very good. Thank you so much. And all those links and Trisha's information will be in the show notes. So please look for that. I hope you guys are intrigued about what you heard today. I hope you're interested and you just want to go down the rabbit hole with us. <laughs> oh my gosh, I lost so much sleep just learning about this. But I just want to encourage you, if you, any of these things made you think about yourself or your family, um, maybe something just felt like, oh, I need, to, I need to think about that. I need to look into that. Listen to it. That's your intuition, most likely, or your instincts. That's how things started for me. I was listening to someone talk about tongue tie on a workshop. I'd been ignoring a friend who kept telling me that she thought there was something. And when I heard this lady give the workshop, I goosebumps within like 
the first five minutes. And I was like, okay, I need to look into this. <laughs> so listen, and, and again, share, you know, don't be afraid to talk about it with other people. Um, and please share this episode if you are, you know, if it does hit home. So I invite you to learn more, reach out to me. If you have questions, reach out to Trish and we'll help connect you to someone who can support you where you live. Thank you again, Trish. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thanks so much. I love it. So before we go, I'd like to remind my listeners, if you're interested in working with me, please visit my website at sweetslimmertime.com and hit the contact tab to schedule a sleep intervention call and we'll chat. I'm looking forward to talking to you again next week. I'll see you soon.